evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Nicholas, and I help direct the events here at Strand. For a little bit of history, the Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 92 years, Strand is the sole survivor, still run by the Bass family and still housing new and used books. The ones in this room are particularly rare. So have a look-see after the event. Thank you for coming to the rom-com panel. I hope we have some repeat faces from yesterday's romance game night. And if so, I hope you had a good time last night. Tonight, we're excited to welcome another incredible group of romance writers. So let's go through all these bios, man. They're very talented, so I'm going to try and go fast. Uh, Summer Heacock is an author of contemporary women's fiction who, when not writing or hoarding jelly beans, Good, ho good hobbies, is a member of the Midwest Writers Planning Committee and a co-host of Pub Talk TV. She can be found at fizzygirl.com and on Twitter as fizzygirl. That's, that's fizzygirl with G-R-R-L. So don't misspell it as girl. Spell it girl. All right, cool. Crashing the A-List is her second novel following The Awkward Path to Getting Lucky. Abby Jimenez is a Food Network champion, motivational speaker, contemporary romance novelist, and founder of Nadia Cakes, a bakery that has since gone on to open multiple locations in two states and won numerous Food Network competitions. The Friend Zone is her first book. Christina Forrest is a would-be choreographer who instead decided to hone her writing craft at Rowan University and earned her MFA in creative writing with a concentration in writing for children at the New School right down the street. She currently works in children's book publishing. I Wanna Be Where You Are is her first novel. Helena Hunting is a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author who writes all things romance, contemporary, romantic comedy, sports, and angsty new adult. Meet Cute and Making Up are her latest romantic comedies. Handle with Care will publish next month, August 2019. And tonight, we'll be moderated by Elena Nicolau, entertainment writer at Refinery29, where she covers books, movies, TV, viral network, network, Netflix <laughs> sensation, Netflix, and her latest obsessions, whatever that happens to be. So without further ado, get this guy off the mic. Please join me in welcoming this awesome group of writers to the Strand. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this Friday evening to talk about the most important things in the world, books and love. Um, <laughs> so I'm Elena Nicolau. I am moderating our panel. I'm a writer at Refinery29. Um, and we're here to talk about rom-coms. The world's kind of crazy right now, but luckily we are also living through a rom-com renaissance, both on screen and in our books. I think To All the Boys I Loved Before on Netflix was like the most watched movie of last year. And then if you go into any bookstore, like The Strand, all over the shelves you'll see books like these four with these beautiful illustrated covers, and they indicate that you're in for a lovely romance of all different kinds of varieties. So, and I think that these four authors show just how wide uh, and broad the rom-com genre has become in publishing. We have books about a teenage ballerina. We have books about a woman struggling with endometriosis. And they all get to be stars of their own love stories. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, and I would love for the four authors here to introduce their books and to also to get into the rom-com theme, tell us what their job, what their uh, what their job would be if they were starring in a rom-com. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess I'm closest to you, so I guess that means I go first. Um, let's see, if I had a rom-com job, I think I would own a dog rescue. Yeah, because I could just picture like the heroine having like a satchel, a dog satchel, and like, you know, some geriatric chihuahua named like 
like Harry Puppins or something <laughs> in the satchel, and you know she's rescuing all these animals. I think it'd be super cute. Um, my book is The Friend Zone, and it's a story about a young woman who is about to have a partial hysterectomy due to uh, severe uterine fibroids, and she's mostly okay with this, except for that she's just met this fabulous young man named Josh. And he wants a huge family, and he wants a huge family in the traditional way. So she knows that she can never give him what he wants, so she puts him in the friend zone. And it's a book about self-acceptance and self-worth, and it's a roller coaster ride, and if you've read it, <laughs> you've probably ugly cried on a beach somewhere this summer. Um, but yeah, really fun, really funny, and um, super excited to be here with these amazing authors today. Sounds great. <laughs> Awesome. I'm Helena Hunting. Um, if I, if we talked about this job thing, and then you talked about the dog, and now I want to change my job. Um, so originally I wanted to do clay sculpting in a retirement home, but now I would like to open, because I think that would be super funny, and I always think about the little lady with the sculptures that look inappropriate. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think I would all, uh, there's a cat cafe in Scotland and I would like to have one of those. But my agent could never come there because she's highly allergic to cats. And I feel like the whole food thing might be a little weird. I don't think you can actually have any food because there's cats. But it would be zen for me anyways and the four people who don't have allergies who can go there. <laughs> um, so we're so we were supposed to have the elevator pitch ready and you did such a great job but I suck at that. Um, so I would just tell you that a guy and a girl meet. But so my agent is really good at this. So I actually printed it out and I'm going to read it to you because I can't memorize it. Um, after a rather humiliating first encounter or meet you with her childhood crush, former Hollywood actor Daxton Hughes, Kaylin, this is a lot of names, Kaylin Flowers forms a competitive relationship with him throughout law school. Super fun, right? She thought they were friends, but he sabotaged her in their last year, and she was determined to never think about him or see him again. And he was, like, retired from acting, so it was fine. Uh, but eight years later, he ends up in her law office, and he needs some help. Um, and she thinks that he's a jerk. And then she finds out that uh, his parents have passed away, and he now has um, custody of his 13-year-old sister. So I mean, how are you going to turn your back on somebody in that kind of state, right? Uh, and then, to add a little bit more drama, her boss dangles a promotion um, as a partner if she gets Dax to come over to their law firm. And she realizes that that crush that she thought she kind of grew out of never she never did, and, and that it's not a one-way street. Okay. So Thank that's the story. Well. <laughs> I said it in front of a mirror about three times. <laughs> I'm Christina Forrest. Um, I think my rom-com job would be the job I wish I had anyway, which is to name nail polish colors. Mm. <laughs> Or to be a casting director for movies because I always, yeah, I always see, ca I'm like, oh, that was not, it's not good. They should have had this person. And then I text my best friend and we just recast the whole movie. And we were always like, we should just have this be our job. But we, it's not our jobs. Um, but that's what I would do if I was in a rom-com. Um, I wrote I Want to Be Where You Are, which is a young adult rom-com about a ballerina named Chloe who sneaks out behind her mom's back and goes on a road trip for a dance audition. And she is joined by her neighbor, a boy named Eli, who she really hates. So it's a hate-to-love romance, and it takes place over the course of like 10 days, and they get into a lot of shenanigans along the way. I hate going last, and all the good fake jobs are taken. <laughs> um, that I came up with this for a, a book a while ago, and then I was just obsessed with the idea. So if I was um, a rom-com character, I would be a founder of one of those companies like Thinks. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah. It's the, 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 yeah, the, the underwear for, you know, monthly needs. I, I mean, I wrote a book about vaginas, okay, for periods, underwear for periods, um, but I, I just think that would be really fun rom-com lead, like come at my feminist position or something. Um, I wanted to work with the puppies and the kitties, but they took the, 
<laughs> it's not my fault. Um, okay, so my but what? I do Gold like fish. horses. <laughs> Mine always Gold die. Fish, and then my person, they would obviously die because turtles live turtles, forever. Yeah, I would be the person that escorts the baby turtles <laughs> to the ocean. <laughs> Thank you for the assist on that. <laughs> Ever so slightly more appealing. Um, my book, God, what is my book about? Um, my book is about uh, a woman, an editor in New York City. By the way, my book is literally like, like how to get in every single trope bingo. It wasn't <laughs> intentional, but it just worked out that way. Um, so she's an editor, and she got laid off by um, her company going under when it was bought out by a big um, e-retailer called Alcatraz, which is not based on any giant e-retailer <laughs> at all. <laughs> and uh, so she takes a job for her um, brother's fiance's uncle, clearing out abandoned or repossessed storage units, and one of them was run or owned by an escort service back in like the 80s, early 90s, and she finds the escort resume of, he was a 19-year-old kid at the time, but now he is a very famous, very well-regarded Shakespearean actor uh, named Caspian Tiddleswick, who is also not at all based on <laughs> anyone specific. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> uh, she comes across his resume and, um, she debates with her and her best friend and they debate selling it to TMZ or something to get her off of her little brother's couch where she is now living. Um, and the guilt from that makes her feel so bad. So she tries to find a way through her publishing contacts to get that information back to him, to let him know it's gonna be safe, like you don't have to worry about it coming out, but he misinterprets that as she is blackmailing him. And so he shows up and starts blackmailing her and I don't know, hijinks and sexual tension ensue. <laughs> yeah, and you get to imagine Benedict Cumberbatch actually doing it the whole time, or at least I did. I mean. I did too. I, I may. It's possible. <laughs> I should have worn the blazer, you're right. <laughs> um, so one of my favorite writers is named Alana Bennett, and she had a thread that went viral talking about how you can tell a rom-com is good, and it's all based on how the love interest looks, how, how the guy looks at the girl. If he looks at her with like real love in his eyes, you know that the rom-com is good. But you can't do that in a book because there is no visual. So I'm wondering when you're writing a couple, how do you make that chemistry come through? Like, what's the equivalent of the movie gaze in a book, if that makes sense? Like, how do you, how do you make the couple get along on the, you know what, never mind. I'll no, ask no, 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 I, I mean, like the meat, I had an answer for that. <laughs> like, yeah. Are we going down the row or are we yeah, shouting yeah, out yeah. now? Yeah, it's like, ooh, unruly. <laughs> uh, I, I go through banter. That's, yeah. that's right. a quippy yeah. banter, either the enemies to lovers, like hateful banter with that, I'm definitely mm -hmm. gonna jump you in 30 pages thing, or that like, you know, they're so comfortable with each other that they have the quick back and forth. So that's my gaze, if they can riff off each other. Yeah. I like the dual POV, because I, I write in dual POVs, so I like it that we know what he's thinking, and then when we're in her POV, she's maybe misinterpreting something that he's doing, but you as the reader are in on the joke, and you know that he's super into her and, like, you know, pining away. That's how I do it. I love that. Yeah. All of your books had such good banter. That's why I wanted to know how you channeled it. Um, so this is sort of a chicken or the egg question, but when you're sitting down and you want to write a new book, what comes first, the love interest or the protagonist? How do you devise your characters? Um, I think it depends on the book, but I usually see both of them at the same time. Like, because I'm like a visual thinker, so I'll just like be minding my business like in the shower, and I'll see two people talking to each other, and I'll be like, I wonder what that is. And then for my first book, um, I Want to Be Where You Are, I actually dreamt this story, but it was mostly just a boy and a girl in a car, like looking at each other like angrily, <laughs> and I was like, what's that? And my other book I can't really talk about, but I like imagined the two of them standing in front of this house, also sort of doing the same thing. I think I really like to write tension but I always like, I see both of them at the same time. Yeah. 
I my see oh, her. Sorry, you go first. I see her first, and then I always ask myself, who is she? And then I write the man that's perfect for her. Um, my books actually both came from dreams yeah. as well. I read um, that in your... <laughs> my first one came, the first thing I saw about that book was that a woman went on TV and accidentally made cupcakes that were supposed to be elephants but entirely looked like penises and then like <laughs> slammed her hands down on it. And I, I literally wrote a book around that because I thought it needed to happen. Um, <laughs> I mean, in all fairness, it was literally like, I've always wanted to write a book about this broken vagina disorder, and I'm like, I bet elephant penis, you know, thing could go with that. And, um, but this, the one that's not about broken vaginas and elephant slash penises is, um, I had this one, this one was, I don't recommend this as like a muse, so don't, don't be like your Auntie Summer. Um, I had a heart attack uh, in 2014, 15? Is it weird? I don't remember. Um, and it, was, it totally wasn't my fault. Like I, my doctor gave me the wrong migraine medicine and gave it again, and my heart went bloop. Um, and so I was have, like drugged up and like all these tubes attached to me, and I had this like medicated fever dream about Benedict Cumberbatch in storage units. <laughs> And I was like, I kind of wrote it down in my notes app, like, man, this is neat. And then like later I found it, I'm like, oh, that could be a book. But in a way that doesn't get me sued, so. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. You won't get well, sued. His name isn't Benedict, only on your shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's just, I mean, it's night and day, Benedict Cumberbatch, Caspian Tiddleswick. Not the same. Not at all. <laughs> um, a hero always comes always comes first for me. I don't know why. I just really relate to testosterone, I guess. I'm not sure. Nice. Um, but yeah, and then the, so I generally form the hero in his personality, and then who is the perfect sassy female who can, you know, be the right partner. Helena, did you base Daxton off of a real celebrity? Because I know he's a I celebrity too. I don't actually do that, except everybody is Jason Momoa in my head. <laughs> <laughs> or Chris Hemsworth. Oh. Or Chris Evans. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Any one of those three are good. Someone should me. write a romance series about the Chrises. It's a free idea. <laughs> yeah, the, all the Chrises. It hasn't sold yet, but my next one is literally called Dear Chris Evans. Oh. So, <laughs> all right. I got you. Put, you putting that on my calendar for 2020. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so this event is called Rom-Com Night, and we've been talking about rom-coms as if we were all on the same page about what a rom-com is. But I think the genre is kind of emerging in the book world, and it's a little bit different than movies, maybe. I'm curious about how all of you define rom-coms and maybe like um, how they compare to romance novels and what you think of the genre. Um. <laughs> Well, I guess, well, they have to be funny. Well, I yeah. think that, and they have to revolve around the relationship. That has to be the main plot, and there has to be a happily ever after. Yeah. Those are like my three things. Yeah. A lot of the times, you know, with the resurgence of the rom com, I see a lot of these lists. They're like the top rom com movies of the summer. And I'm like, that's not rom com. That's not rom com. I mean, like, you guys are here. You probably like rom coms too. I'm sure you've seen those lists as well. But you know, it, it, there are certain criteria of a rom-com. Yeah. And they have to be funny. Definitely, yeah. You know, like, like some, of the, some of your books, all of your books were funny. Some of them got sad, too. But that can still be a rom-com. So I think yeah. that's why I was wondering. All four of your books are so different, and they're still rom-com, so. Like, Abby's book is, like, there was moments in there where I was just ugly crying in the middle of the night, but it also is the funniest line I have ever read in a book ever. Nothing has ever made me laugh as hard in a book as that one sentence in your book. So she, I think she nailed the sad and the... It has to do... Can I say it? Or do, we, do you not mean to spoil it for people? Say it. <laughs> um, it. It is her first time sharing the physical act of love with uh, uh, the dude on screen. And she starts talking about how just unbelievably pretty his dick is and says, I want to make that dick my screensaver. And I just, or no, wait, wallpaper? It was a wallpaper screensaver. I thought it was screensaver. No, it's screensaver. You remembered okay, it correctly. Because yeah, yeah. that made it even funnier, the idea of it like bouncing around. <laughs> 
<laughs> God, I love that. Anyway, sorry. Especially if it was stacked wallpaper, right? Like <laughs> sorry. It's just like oh my God, hundreds children of the here. same over and over again. Um, I th- yeah, I think rom-com it has shifted a lot in the last few years. Like, definitely, there's the, the emotional aspect of it. But I think it's... It can be contemporary romance, but you have to laugh. There has to be something to give it that levity, right? So that when you're coming away from it, there's like this sense of lightness, even if you've had to go through something very heavy yeah. to get there. Yes, your book is ha- all your characters go through heavy stuff in yeah. your book. Well, that's life though, right? But as long as there's something nice at the end of it, that's, that's I think what we're all looking for. Yeah. Well, that's why it's an escape. Something that somebody said at the Bryant Park panel the other day was, when you read a rom-com, even if things do get heavy, if you're reading a romance, you know that you're going to have that guaranteed HEA. So it's almost like a safe place where even though the author's taking you on this journey, you know it's going to be okay. And so like you can you know, just let yourself be taken away. Yeah. That's what I love about rom-coms. You know, yeah. even, if they, even if they are very emotional or have a lot of depth at some point, you know, you know that you're going to be happy at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, speaking of happy endings, it is interesting that all of your books, they do have happy endings, obviously, that's part of the genre, but you leave your couples off in different places. Like, I think there's only one wedding at the end of your books, no spoilers. How do you, in 2019, like, what do you think constitutes a happy ending for a couple? Does it always have to be a wedding? Can it be something different? I, I mean, for both of my books, it's that somebody finally gets laid. I know that's like, it's like a happy ending. I didn't, I didn't realize I was being really literal about that. I didn't realize it until just now, but go on. It depends on the character. I think you have to do whatever is right for that character, you know? Yeah. Yeah, like all Shakespeare's comedies ended in a wedding, but that, I don't think that would be right for every book now. <laughs> I, so I, I had this conversation with my agent uh, about um, epilogues and um, so, like the reader need, f- I feel like you want to tie it with a bow so that they can see that the characters are happy at the end. So, and I would get to the end and I'd be like, I don't want to write this epilogue. <laughs> and so I stopped writing epilogues at the end and about four chapters before I'm done, I write the epilogue because I so that I can just I'll just move them all to that place and then I'll get there bring them there yeah. Um, yeah so I think they don't always need to be married it depends on you know where they are in their lives I think as long as their relationship is stable and you're giving the reader the sense that they're you know going off into the sunset happily together skipping along that's sort of like that's what you want to leave them with, right? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Same. Okay, Same. cool. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, so another thing I was wondering about, I've been thinking about this a lot. I saw this survey that came out the other day that said, I think it's like way over 50% of couples now meet online, and none of the characters in your books meet online. And I, I, I wonder if the meat cute itself is an endangered species, uh, and how you think, like, couples will, if meet cutes can still exist, and how you think like romance, the genre, will adapt to the new way that people are meeting, if that's something you ever plan to cover in any of your books. Or if like the meet cute will stay alive in books forever, even as we're like meeting online. I don't know, man. I'm old. I need my <laughs> meet cute. Like yeah. I am very yeah. stuck in my traditional, they are going to meet cutely ways. Yeah. Like I, I, I can't. I've never swiped whatever way. I like. I don't. I wouldn't even know how to write that. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna leave that to the youngins <laughs> who are coming up behind us. You know. Definitely. I think. Uh, I think there's. Uh, I think that's too real life for me to write about. I t- at my age. I, uh, my age. At this point in my life, if I had an online date, I think I would be forever alone. I just can't even imagine. Um, so just, you know, no. Uh, <laughs> no, I just can't see me in online dating getting along. I, I feel like that whole me cue, like that, that chance meeting is really what, and the, and the entertaining way in which we force these two people into each other's lives is what makes it so much more exciting, right? Like, I think that's 
And I don't think it really matters how it's done. I, as long as it feels relevant and current, it doesn't necessarily have to be an online dating thing. Personally, I like the intimacy of our characters meeting in person face to face. Or in you a know? car crash like I, your characters. Yeah, yes. you know, like when one person rear ends the other person at a stoplight. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, there's and there's a lot of contemporary um, romantic comedies out there right now, like Christina Lauren's My Favorite Half Night Stand, that really explores um, online dating. So there's definitely those books out there. I'm not saying I'll never do it, but for me, like when I think about, I have a three book deal and I'm already like writing book number four and they don't meet online. I just, I like the intimacy of that meeting in person. Yeah, I think readers do too. That's why, I mean, I, I love reading like about real meet cutes, even though they don't really happen in the wild as much as they used to. So <laughs> I'm curious. Um, well, I guess I write young adults, so it's a little easier for me to avoid that because they right. meet in like classes and at summer jobs and stuff like that. Oh um, God, please don't ever have your tender, like <laughs> oh your kids meet on Tinder. I, I, I would have a problem that, with that. Don't, isn't there like an That's age like euphoria thing on Tinder? Like you have to euphoria. be a certain age. Isn't no. like Instagram the new Tinder? Oh, see, I mean, yeah, I guess. I, guess. I actually don't know. I don't want it. So I don't know. Well, that's a good segue. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No. It's a good segue because when I was reading your book, I was like transported back to being 17 and in love for the first time. And I wanted to know what that was like, like writing, putting yourself back in that perspective and writing a, a YA rom com, how that might compare to an adult. Um, so I don't have to transport myself back that far. I still feel <laughs> very much connected to my teenage self. And the the voice comes to me very easily. Like Chloe was like right here and all the other books that I work on, the characters are so close to me. And I still am really close with all of my high school best friends. And it's not like we just like hash it out and talk about high school all the time, but we do talk about high school memories a lot. And I don't know, it's just very, I think that a lot of things that you experience as a teenager, like for the first time you continue to think about and then also experience as adults as well. Um, so I think that there are a lot of things, like you might be falling in love for the first time in high school, like for the first time, period, but then you meet people and you fall in love for the first time with this person or for the first time with that person, you know? So they're always like first to write and I think that's sort of how what like bridges like YA romance and adult romance those yeah. like themes right right but she you know when you're reading a YA romance she, she has so much less bag her fear is yeah. of a different kind than the fear yeah. maybe of the three other protagonists and something that I really like about all four of your books is it really is like as much about the women's journeys of becoming themselves as it is about their love story and they're, they're really linked I mean I would love to beginning with Abby for you to talk about like how you balanced your character's growth with the love story and I was like just because I was so touched by your character's journey like with her health yeah so um, I don't know if everybody who's read this knows this but the infertility struggle in the story that I wrote is actually my best friend's real life struggle with infertility my best friend Lindsay had a full hysterectomy due to severe uterine fibroids at the age of just 29 so a lot of what we talked about when I interviewed her was really the feeling of lack of self-worth. Um, my, my best friend's current husband is very much a Josh, and he wanted biological children. He wanted his own kids, and she was not able to give that to him, and that was very difficult for her to allow him to make that sacrifice to be with her. Um, and that's really, when people read my book, that's one thing they say, that th that feels very authentic, that Kristen's feelings of, um, you know, lack of self-worth and how she wouldn't accept herself the way she was, that that felt very real. And I know if you read the book, you probably wanted to straddle her and choke her and be like, just let him love you. But that's <laughs> realistic. And I think people that have had severe health issues um, can identify and relate to that because, I mean, how do you let somebody sacrifice something that's so important to them just to be with you and especially when you don't feel like you're worth it? So, um, you know, really, we say this book is a book about infertility. It's, it's about a character who struggles with infertility, but more than anything, this is a book about self-worth and self-acceptance and allowing yourself to be loved despite what you think are flaws. And that was really Kristen's growth throughout the novel. And you know, Josh's growth was giving up what 
he had always envisioned for himself to put somebody else first and to change what he had pictured as his perfect happy ever after and, and change that because his desires shifted once he realized what she meant to him. So um, I'm very happy to report that my best friend is married to a Josh and that those men do exist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's always good to know that rom-coms aren't purely fictional, that there's some, there's good stuff out there. He's a great guy. <laughs> I forgot what the question was. Oh, yes, balancing journeys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know if either, any of you have anything else to add, but. Um, when I'm writing uh, the, you know, oh, I can't word, sorry, protagonist, <laughs> um, my thoughts, and, and I'm, I'm very, very specific about this, and I, I, I try to focus on it a lot, is if you were to lift the dude right out of the story, does she still have a story without him? And so each of my main characters, it's the man is a part of it, but even if he were gone, it would be like this very realistic aspect of like in my current one, she's been laid off and she's trying to get back on her feet in a way that makes her feel good about the way she's doing it. Not that she's, you know, compromising who she is as a person and, and just letting it take her under. She just keeps fighting, keeps getting up every day and, and you know, hoping for the best. And, you know, sure, this stuff with the, you know, sexy British movie star comes in, but I mean, if you lift out their little aside, she still has a full journey from start to finish herself. Yeah. And that's what I try to get out of it for, right. for mine. So. Yeah. So th there is like a character journey and there is a lot of sexy British stuff, which is what makes the book so <laughs> lovely and what makes all of these books so lovely. We were talking about this back there, but, um, as romance writers, like, we were talking about whether or not your moms and your parents and your your daughters and your kids read these books that you write. Could you talk a little bit about that and like who who you let read your books, right? or or if you've ever if there's ever been like a moment where yeah, you have a story, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah, um, <laughs> my 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 first book is indeed about vaginas, and the um, dedication <laughs> of it is me begging my mother not to read past the dedication. <laughs> um, but, as one good turn deserves another, uh, she refuses to read my books nor tell her friends about them because until I can use my intelligence to write a book without all those swear words <laughs> in them, until I can overcome that language. And I'm like, how do you even know that's in there? You've never read them. She's like, I know you. <laughs> So my, my children are not allowed to pick up a copy of my first book as the first <laughs> sentence is, I can't frost this cupcake, my vagina is broken. <laughs> um, the second one, my daughter, who's about to turn 13, could read. Um, she, she told me that her, uh, her daughter, who is extremely literary and awesome, she's read my books and I'm trying really hard to maintain eye contact with her now. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, my 13-year-old has informed me that Summer's book, Crash in the A-List, is her favorite book, not my book. <laughs> <laughs> she, she read my book, but I put, like, post-its over everything. Like, it was this incredibly, like, edited, like, you can read this, but without all the stuff. And as far as, like, F-bombs go, my kids hear that, like, at home all the time. So <laughs> I didn't care about them reading that in Summer's book. Oh, God, <laughs> and there's so many. <laughs> you gave it exactly as many fucks as it deserved. <laughs> I feel like yours are okay for your mom to read. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah you've got this. I will, I wouldn't let anybody really, except for like my critique partners and stuff, read it until like ARCs were out. Um, but my mom's a very slow reader. And so it was at that point, I was like, you might as well just wait for the book to come out. And she was like, no, I have the ARC. I'm going to read it. And then she would live text me while she was reading it, which is an experience, oh regardless of who the person is. But because it was my mom, it was kind of like she, like one day she'd be like, oh, you wrote your ass off on this chapter. And I'm like, thanks, mom. <laughs> and, then, and then Eli, who's the love interest, is like kind of prickly. He's got like a lot of baggage with him. And, you know, he's 
you, I want you to hate him in the beginning as much as Chloe hates him. And so then she'd be like, oh, Eli is so annoying. And I'd be like, okay, it's okay for me to say that. But like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't need you to tell me that. Like, wait until you get to this certain part. So other than that, I feel like most of the content is like, yeah, yeah. There are no wait. I do have a story. So I was teaching some middle schoolers a writing workshop over the weekend, and one student pulled me aside and was like, "I have a question for you." And I was like, "Okay." And she was like, "Why all the profanity?" Oh. <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, how old are you again?" And she was like, "Ten." I was like, "Well, I wrote this for people who are a little bit older, but there are like a few f bombs, but maybe like five. But I just thought they that was scald. really funny. They scald that time yeah, scald. she was like, "This has so much cursing." I was like, "I'm sorry." <laughs> you know, people keep leaving those reviews for me. They're like, "I picked this up, but everyone has such a foul mouth." I'm like, "Is my bio too subtle for anyone?" <laughs> <laughs> and for the record, there are 76 fucks to give in that book. <laughs> do you do you do a search like a find? Oh, do I do. You, yeah, because me too. before there was yeah. like 124. Yeah. And I I, I didn't. Just My mom down, is right? so right about me. <laughs> I, I did a search, too, after I got... I, I feel like, is that like... That's normal. That's like that's every normal. every writer gets like one review that's like the profanity. And I did a search, and I was like, okay, seriously, there's only you like did. one fuck for every two and a half pages. You need to relax. <laughs> right? Not that many. This is why like she and I beta read for each other now. Uh, and it's, we're both like, is there too many fucks in this book? Like, no, you could definitely fuck it up more. I'm the, <laughs> I am the wrong one to ask. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, professionalism. <laughs> my mom reads all my books. I told her not to. <laughs> she doesn't listen. So, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. It's just, most of them she likes. There's been a few where I was like, I told, I said don't, and you, I said don't, and don't come at me with any questions because I have no answers for you. Um, but me cute, she was like, I really like that one. Oh. <laughs> It was so nice. And I was like, okay, that's because there weren't as many fucks to give in that one. <laughs> Maybe she'll become addicted to rom-coms like I am. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> she'll be a good convert. Um, yeah, speaking of parents, there are so many parents in your books. They, they, they all show up in different ways, which mm -hmm. is sort of interesting. Your, the mom in your book is really a whirlwind. Um, anyway, so I... That, that, was a, that was my own thought. But um, I think that like all of us secretly want our lives to become a rom-com, or maybe just I do. And I'm wondering <laughs> <laughs> where you get your inspiration from. If you read the vows section, if you're always like listening to your friends for their love stories, you know, are, are you like a magnet for people's meet-cutes and, and how you get inspiration for your books? I mean, I was hopped up on morphine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so... I mean, I, I would not hate if not Benedict Cumberbatch just showed up on my doorstep one day. So, you know, like I, I go to these books for, I mean, the real world is horrible and a giant trash fire. So if I'm going to read something, I'm going to read something that's going to take me to a good place. And if a famous actor wanted to show up on my door, one that I happen to admire, like, yay, <laughs> you know? So I... I I want escapism. I call my books mac and cheese for your brain because, you know, it's it's soothing. You're guaranteed the happily ever after, and it's escapism. And, you know, I don't think it's particularly common for British movie stars to show up on somebody's door, but it'd be cool if it was. <laughs> I love hearing other people's love stories. I have this one friend. They're together now, but she was married to someone else, and she he went to her wedding and he we were at dinner and he was telling us what it was like to watch her get married and he was sitting there and he was like literally clutching hand over his heart and he was like the woman that i am supposed to be with i am like watching her marry someone else and like that just i feel like i need to write that into a wrong, like into a book one day because like god that just that pining, that tension, you know, where like this man is just, he, he knows that this is the woman he's supposed to be with. And she was. They've been together 10 years now. She got divorced and he like instantly s snatched that up. I was going to say, um, this better have a happy ending or we are going to fight. <laughs> like, oh my God. I love hearing other people's love stories and how they met. And it, it's, it's so like when Harry met Sally, I love that. Yeah. yeah. I feel like everyone in this room probably has a story that could be turned into a rom-com if we just interviewed them for long enough. <laughs> um, so speaking of celebrity, this is something I've been 
thinking about ever since I read your book, Summer. If you, the three of you had to write a book with a celebrity as either the protagonist or the love interest, who would you choose and why? And Summer, you can, you know, I know you did Chris Evans maybe is your next one. But. Uh, Tessa Thompson. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> Are you really? really? <laughs> <laughs> no, she is my wife, but I understand. Um, I think... I would have Tessa Thompson as the heroine. I'd have to think, oh no, Michael B. Jordan. What am I talking about? Michael B. Jordan. (laughs) That's a good one. I have a list. (laughs) Yeah, Jace Momoa, straight (laughs) at the top, with all the tattoos. Um, Mm -hmm. Chris Hemsworth, next. Chris Evans after that. (laughs) There's a list. Wouldn't kick him out of bed for eating crackers? None of them. I would kick none of them out. (laughs) <laughs> um, I can't really think like who I would write into my book, but my second book, The Happy Ever After Playlist, uh, she actually meets a famous rock star. That's the, that is the hero of that book. And he is like completely written as a bearded Chris Evans. Yes. But like, were you not wed, like who would you want to show up on your doorstep, baby? Bearded Chris, Chris Evans. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I have good news yeah. for all of you. Uh, in on stereo. he's here. No, he's no. not. Oh, come on. Imagine. No, on um, Wednesday there's a movie on Netflix where Chris Evans has a beard and he's like rescuing people. You can watch it as many times as you want. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yay! I saw that ad when I was walking through Times Square on to get to the RWA hotel and I crashed into. <laughs> And I didn't tell anybody that would be an because picture. it was so, like, too embarrassing to be, well, I guess it is kind of funny. But I was like, what's he doing on Netflix? And, like, walked right in. That there. is awesome. If you're going to get, like, injured over something, you're <laughs> to Chris Evans. Can so we make a pact? If any of our books get made into a movie and he plays Bearded anyone, we are all going yeah, to the yes. red carpet. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, this you is all binding. heard it. This yeah. is binding. Yes. Do you cast your movies in your head? Like, oh, yeah. Oh, so who's, who's playing your characters in the movie adaptation that you've invented? Um, let's see. Anna Kendrick is definitely Kristen. So oh my love. I love Teresa Palmer for Sloan because she just has like that beautiful vulnerability about her. Uh, Josh, I'm, I'm open for suggestions for Josh. Originally, I was thinking like maybe Chris Pratt, but I think he's like maybe a little bit too old. Maybe like a newcomer. He's got to have great dimples. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I like hearing everybody else's ideas for Josh. Beardless Jason Momoa. <laughs> Does he look good without a beard? Yeah, sure. I uh, yeah. Your brand is solid. Yeah. And I like <laughs> it. <laughs> a little obsessed, maybe. Call. I mean, who isn't? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I saw like Yara Shahidi as Chloe. Um, and I can't think of this actor's name, but he's on this TV <laughs> he's on this TV show. Um, <laughs> It's not Empire. It's the other one about power. singer. Power. No, not Power though. But it's about Star. Yes, the the boyfriend. Somebody IMDb it. P Diddy's son. Yeah, him. Oh, you just, tried. She's you a cheesy writer. Google. So. <laughs> Quincy. 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 I I think his name is Quincy. That's who I saw as Eli. Well, he looks like. <laughs> yes, like I'll be sure who I know who that is. Yeah, his real dad is I'll be sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh. <laughs> uh, I'm actually terrible at this. I I I can never pick a person. For, I had Anna Kendrick for my first one because I thought she, she could deliver the sass for awkward path. Fun. But um, and I'll be very honest with you, I have a very calculated and rehearsed answer for this of, well, yeah, most people would think Benedict Cumberbatch, but this is really based off of an amalgamation of Cumberbatch, Hiddleston, a little Mad Smith, all lies. <laughs> <laughs> but if anybody like tries to record this, Tom Hiddleston, Matt Smith, a little Cumberbatch, just a tad. <laughs> <laughs> but I really, I really don't know for anybody else. It's probably terrible of me. I just sort of see them in my head, not as people that exist. That's what the casting director of Christina is for. She's there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's the wrong garbage. <laughs> anyway, uh, we are opening this up to questions. Oh, so think of your questions for these four wonderful authors. And Nick is back there with a the microphone. <gasps> One in the second oh. row. Oh, God. I said dick in front of a kid. <laughs> it's okay. I've read your book. 
Yeah, you have. I'm um, just gonna look at the table. It's cool. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> this is Abby's daughter asking a question. Yeah. <laughs> I just like to say, Mom, it's not my fault that your book is not my favorite. It's just because I, I kind of okay. I read the back of Summer's book and I was like, Tiddles, Tiddleswick. I was like, I Are like you that. at all excited that at least my blurb is on her cover? No. <laughs> I didn't notice. I was like, I was like, <laughs> I am the least cool person in my household. Right? You just got dragged by your daughter. <laughs> every day. It's like this every day. I don't read the cover. I read what's inside. <laughs> See, she's doing it right. Books and judging covers. We're not supposed to do that, right? My mom didn't teach me that. That's for sure. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I tweet about this all the time. See, mm-hmm. it's real. I know. <laughs> um, so I actually have a question. Don't worry. So oh, yeah. Yeah. how long have you known Summer? Because I actually, like, <laughs> I already knew that, like, Summer thanked my mom in her acknowledgments. But then I was like, did my mom think Summer? So I went into my mom's book, and she did. So how long have you guys, like, known each other? And, like, what exactly <laughs> did you guys do to contribute to each other's books? So there was this cake. Yeah, there was a cake that accidentally looked like a vagina. And um, I think you have to explain your other job, too. Okay, so I own this bakery called Nadia Cakes, and we made an unfortunate geo cake on accident that kind of sort of looked like a vagina. And my comments as the admin for that went viral, like crazy, crazy viral. viral. You should just just Google the geo. We trademarked the name. And somebody was like, oh my gosh, you have to meet Summer Heacock because she wrote this really funny book about vaginas and this cupcake that looked like something it wasn't supposed to look like. And so we got a virtual introduction on Twitter. And so I've known Summer maybe like two years. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think I I read her book because it sounded like the kind of book I would like, which I did. And we just started like trading manuscripts and like beta reading for each other. Well, it was so bizarre because it, like it was life imitating art, but she was in, she had no idea about my book. And then I, I was like, yeah, this is just too weird. And she's like, oh, I'm a writer. And I'm like, shut up. And then we were just like, let it begin. And so I beta read her, she beta read mine and we wave pom poms for each other a lot. Yeah, if you guys liked The Friend Zone, if you like my writing voice, you will love her book because it's very, actually, I think it's even better than mine. I love you. I just love you. According your to like every website that goes, if you like this, you'll like this. Her book, my book, my book, her book. Yes, very similar. Only le- like her steam level is lower than mine. I am from the old days where people in the chick lit genre, they always faded to black. And so I was not aware that I had to be putting all the getting it on on the And page. you don't. That's why I let my 13-year-old read your stuff. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> well, that awkward has sex-ish. It's, there's a lot of tension, but it's all 13-year-old appropriate. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, Helena, I love you. I haven't seen you since Philly. It's so nice Hi. to see you. It's been a few years. Abby. I am obsessed with you. Oh, oh my God. God, I'm so excited. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so my question is, <laughs> how did you make this transition from Baker? Because you weren't just like some hole in the wall bakery that nobody heard of. I mean, you were on TV. And how does Stuntman Mike feel about being Insta Famous? Oh my gosh. Okay, so Stuntman Mike is my actual dog in real life. You can follow him on Instagram at Stuntman Mikey, and he is exactly like I wrote him in the book. He, and I take him, if, if you're ever in Minnesota and I'm doing a book signing, I actually take him with me and I stand him on the table and he trots back and forth and meets people. He's, oh, I'm serious, he's super charming and he loves children. He's like the sweetest, like he'll take down a toddler. Like he'll, he's a, just freaking adorable. Why didn't you bring um, me a doggy right now? Huh? Why don't you bring your doggy right now? He travels so poorly. He'll Aww. totally poop in an airport or something and embarrass me. It'll, it'll go viral. It'll be everywhere. Um, yeah, he, uh, Stuntman only loves his mom. He does not care about um, anything else. But he, I, I'm taking him, to, I took him to a book club the other day, and it was really cute. He, like, took off and was wandering this person's house, and they found him upstairs in their bedroom. And I really hope he didn't do anything <laughs> bad under their bed, um, as he is wont to do sometimes. Um, but for writing, I, I always 
always loved reading. I was always a very avid reader and um, took creative writing all through high school. You know, then I had kids. I started the bakery, and it was really hard to do anything other than that. And as the bakeries got self-sufficient and we got our teams trained, I just kind of started looking for a hobby. And I started writing as my hobby. And I got really involved in this site called Critique Circle, and I cannot say enough good things about that site. Like, if you are a budding writer or you're looking to polish your craft or you want to figure out how to write a query letter, go to Critique Circle. I spent like a year on that site and it made me the writer that I am today. And I can honestly say like, I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for that. I worked very, very hard and it just, I'm very fortunate that things that I like to do for fun are just things other people like to buy, like cupcakes and like <laughs> romance novels. So that's how I did it. It's my idea of a party. I love your dress. <laughs> Oh, one on the side here. Um, gotcha. Hi. Um, I'm wondering what book or movie made you a rom-com lover? Like, what was your first book or movie entryway into rom-coms? Uh, Ten Things I Hate About You, for me. Um, I just, I always wanted to grow up and... and or someday be able to write a protagonist as well done as Cat, and you know, just so secure in who she was. And Heath Ledger was pure perfection. I will like die on the hill if, if anybody tries to say anything bad about this movie. I'm like, okay, we fight now. But it's <laughs> God, I love that movie. Um, I would say Brown Sugar. It used to come on HBO during the day in the summer. My parents, I like, I mean, it's not that bad, but like, I shouldn't have been watching it at the age that I was watching it. Um, but I really love that movie and also Bridget Jones's Diary. Oh, yeah. That's, really that's my one. second, the yeah. ultimate love triangle. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know if this ages me, but like, Pretty in Pink and Sixteen Candles yeah. were like my, but I rewrote the end of Pretty in Pink recently and decided that Ducky and Molly Ringwald ended up together instead of her and Blaine. And I was like, but, but, but they are just so quirky together. But they weren't. It was Blaine. Yeah. <laughs> he was the right one. I kind of support Ducky, though. I know. I, I, was saying, I'm I rewrote the end. Blaine in my doesn't head. do anything to get her back. Like, he, I don't, I never supported yeah, no. it. Ducky yeah, was friend Ducky zoned. I know he was <laughs> friend zoned. Was. So nicely hard. But he done, get, by the way. <laughs> he got his girl at the end. He got somebody, something. Oh, yeah, he right? yeah, yeah. 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 So he found his own love that wasn't Molly. Mm. I like two I weeks' that, notice. Yeah. That was, know, that was my next. Ghost. Is that what she said? No, 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 oh, no. Two, weeks, no, two weeks, two weeks notice. Oh, and wow. actually, notice. there's a current one that I, it's, I love. Why him? That movie, Why him? Oh, well, that's a very uh, funny movie. I freaking love that movie. Okay. Like, I feel like I could have written that book. Okay. Like, oh, it's just such. It's so funny. It's it's about. Um, uh, this girl brings home James Franco, and he's like this really like like he seems like a total deadbeat. And so her dad, Brian Cranston, is like, "Why are you dating him?" But he turns out to be a tech billionaire. Yeah. Spoil it a plot twist. It's, it's quite it's quite funny. I love that movie. Yeah. My husband's like, why do you like this movie? I'm like, I don't know, I just like it. I'll answer this question. My favorite rom-coms were like, I had a box set of all the Hugh Grant ones from the 90s. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Definitely, those are my favorite. I could watch Notting Hill like every day. Every day, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. And I will die on the tail. I think Love Actually is a great movie. Uh, I'm yeah. sure I'm not the only one in this movie, in, in this room that thinks that. And I think that format should come to books. I think that would be a good rom-com. Mm -hmm. It really would. We got time for a couple more questions if people have them. Otherwise, y'all are free to continue. Aha! Uh -huh. so Never a mind. Otherwise, we feel we sad. have a question. Um, just, what is your like actual writing process? Like, oh. is there organization, or do you just like just get right into it, or do you have like do you lay out note cards, or I don't know, just curious, trying to figure out because it's a little bit different than like a heavier novel. So is the story like playing out for you in your mind and then you're just writing it as it happens or? I write on my cell phone with my thumbs. Um, I write like 
about 80% of my books like this. I know, right? And then, well, I'm a social media manager. Like, that's what I do, like, you know, for my, pretty much for my job at this point. And so that's just like a very natural way for me to write. I write on a Google Doc. And then when I have to do major edits or read throughs, then I open up a laptop. But, and I'm very much a panster, like I don't plan things, although my editor's kind of making me plan things because I realize that when I don't, I have to go back and like redo them. So that's mine. I'm exactly the opposite. <laughs> um, so I have 10,000 word outlines and I know the color of my character's underwear, <laughs> what music they listen to, the car they drive, what kind of gum they would chew. Um, before I start writing. So it's like an incredibly detailed process and that takes a little bit of time. Uh, so I'm definitely not a pantser and I really only write in my office and it has to, yeah, I'm, it's a very rigid But structure. you did say you wrote a sex scene on an airplane, right? I do, yeah. Sometimes I write sex scenes on airplanes just, you know, to see whether or not the person beside me will get uncomfortable or what's gonna happen. If you read over my shoulder, it's your fault. <laughs> I'm the same way. I write really very detailed outlines. I even sometimes send them to my editor, just like, I don't want to waste my time. Do you think this makes sense? <laughs> um, and I also do like these character questionnaires that I learned yes. to do, yeah. where it's yeah. like, what's your favorite color? What are you yeah. wearing right now? It, then it's like, if you were an ice cream, what flavor would you be? Like different, because then it like gets me into the character. Um, and I also, after I do that, I have a big poster board where I put like no sticky notes like this chapter it gets like really really intense yeah yeah i yeah my agent actually edits my outlines with me yeah 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 um surprising no one my mine's a little <laughs> weird um i have this place in my brain where i store my stories and i call it my tree house and i just mm. Not to keep, I'm really not as obsessed with Benedict Cumberbatch as this is all coming him off, but if you've ever watched Sherlock, yes. you know how he's got like the <laughs> mind palace. palace. Yeah. So that's my treehouse. I keep all my stories there. Um, so I'll have an idea like the dream, and it'll put a couple bits of the book in there, and you know, as a new bit comes, I'll throw it in the treehouse. And um, when it's time to write the book, sometimes I don't know when it's time, it just sort of happens. Um, <laughs> I swear I'm not saying this to sound like an ass. I'm really sorry. All my books are written in about four days. I sit down and I tell my husband to keep the kids alive and I, I, I write. I write 20, 25,000 words a day and I, I don't smell very good when this is over and I've usually <laughs> lost a little bit of weight because I subsist only on like coffee, Twizzlers and Jelly Bellies, but I have a complete, relatively clean, you can ask my editor, first draft. Wow. I actually think that's how Dostoevsky wrote. I th I'm pretty sure there was some Russian novelist who did that. He wrote it all in his head, and then he sat down and wrote it, and I didn't believe that that was possible. But there we go. Did he use, <laughs> like, possible. Twizzlers and Jelly Bellies, too? Because we could no. hang, you know? Oh, my God. That's wow. Incredible. It's that is incredible. Weird. I don't know. It's not normal. I wish I could just be one of those people that writes, you know, a little bit every day or every week, but instead I just freaking vomit out an entire book and then I can't walk for three days. So that was my question. Like, do you keep the same energy throughout those four days? Yes. Or are you just. Yes, and for some reason, and I have no explanation for this, I have to have a certain movie on in the background on repeat, it's just so I can weirder. have quiet noise that distracts the part of my brain that wants to think about anything else but the book. And for no reason whatsoever, I honestly can't explain it, for Crashing the A-List, it was Fantastic Beasts. Oh, yeah. The first one? Yeah, and then when it came time to edit it, it was Princess Diaries. Oh. I got nothing. I'm surprised no Eddie Redmayne seeped into your book. Uh, actually, there are a lot of characters named after actors in that movie because, like, that's always the hard part coming up with character names and stuff. And I'm like, whatever, placeholder. And then I'm like, oh, I like it. So. <laughs> wow, the writing process moves in mysterious ways. Right? <laughs> I wish my binging episodes were productive. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions, final questions, final comments? Oh, we got one. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, we recently, me and another person here, started a book club, Latin, Latinx Read 2. Follow us, please. Um, 
We recently started it, and we started it with the friend zone. We spoke with Abby, and I just, I just wanted to ask you all that um, since we had such a good communication with Abby, and she responded so fast, and we, sometimes we were like, oh my God, we're bothering her too much. But um, are you guys have a good communication with your readers, or is it sometimes difficult with your busy schedule? You mean like in terms of replying to questions and yeah, stuff? Yeah, like replying to questions, um, comments, anything. Um, yeah, I just, I reply when I, if, I, if I'm tagged, mm -hmm. I just like reply right away. And sometimes I feel like they're probably like, what is she like waiting for me to say something about it? <laughs> because I reply so quickly. So sometimes I like give it two minutes and I'm like, oh my God, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I yeah. literally will sometimes wait like five minutes. So yeah. it doesn't seem like I'm just stalking for yeah. somebody to say something nice <laughs> yeah. to me. Yeah. No, and I, I'm the same way. If somebody's going to take the time out of their day to tell me that they like something that I did, the least I can do is, you know, communicate with them back, thank them for that. I, you know, if they have any questions, answer them. Otherwise, without them, I don't get to write more things. So I appreciate all of their time and input. Okay. Except for the I stuff think. about too much swearing. I get it, and it's not going <laughs> to change. I, I have a reader group on Facebook. It's a... It's fairly, it's, there's a bunch of people in there and they like to post lots of fun stuff. And I comment on as much as I possibly can. Sometimes it gets a little busy in there, depends on what's going on. Uh, and I try my very hardest to respond to Instagram posts and Twitter and all the social media stuff. Yeah, so that they know that I am very grateful that people are reading. Yeah, as a reader, it's so nice that the internet like is a place for readers and authors to connect, like on Instagram especially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's cool you have your own Facebook group, though. That's pretty cool. It's fun. It's called the Beaver Den. <laughs> the Beaver Den. <laughs> oh, yeah, Leah was telling me, our editor was telling me about that. I was like, yeah. ooh, because I have one as well. If, you're, um, if you've read The Friend Zone, um, it's just a discussion group. You can go to my Facebook page. I'm gonna be like really honest. There's a lot of penises in there. Like I don't know why, but that has turned out to be like the number one like posted thing in this group. I don't post them. Everyone else does. <laughs> and my my agent was like, "Do you think maybe we should like scale the penis thing back?" And I was like, "They're having so much fun. <laughs> like I don't know that no one ever leaves the group. So I I guess they like this. Like this is what they want it to be. Um, I do try and keep it on topic and you know post things about the book on occasion just so that you know it is a discussion group, but it's very fun. If you've read the book, please join, uh, but only if you've read the book, because there will be spoilers in there. Oh, it's, so what I've done to avoid that is we have a reader group, and then we have a read-along group. So the reader group is for like everybody who's, uh, there's a bunch of books, so, and then every time we do a new release, we do a read-along so that we don't spoil everything for every, yeah, it's, it's actually, how that yeah, so it's happen. like a group within a group, and if you're not, if you haven't read the book, then you just un- you don't go into the read-along group so that everything doesn't get spoiled. Yeah, yeah I'm going to have to hit yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. Yeah. Oh, my God, what is it like to be that popular? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I could never do anything like that because usually you'd be like, well, at least my mom, mine won't, you know? <laughs> I, I have you... I can't do this on my own. There's somebody organizes me. She's a team. Oh, yeah. That's how popular she is. But literally, if I had the people, no one would come. This is not Field of Dreams for me. <laughs> like, people will come. If you have the group, the people true. will come. Yeah. No, people come for me to make dick jokes on Twitter. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's it. That's, I got Twitter. I've already ruined you. It's fine now. <laughs> Great. I like your kid. I know. <laughs> I'm going to keep her. So. <laughs> That's wow. a great note to end on, yeah. I think. <laughs> Thank you so much for having this discussion. Thank you all for coming out. This was awesome.